I, I think we can get going. Good afternoon. Can everybody hear me? My name is uh, Kevin Smith. I'm managing director for the Michigan Institute for Data Science. I have the privilege of standing in for Al Hero, one of our Midas co-directors who normally uh, introduces our speakers who's unable to uh, attend today. Um, Dr. Dinoff is kicking off our fall seminar series this year. He is the first in a series of um, University of Michigan faculty and invited faculty from across the country that uh, um, will be speaking about data science throughout uh, the semester and the, the course or in the year. Um, before we get into the specifics of uh, Evo's talk this afternoon, I'd just like to remind everybody that uh, our next uh, three uh, seminars will be held here in West Hall in this location. Next Friday, September 28th, uh, Kevin Shu, who's on faculty at University of Toledo in the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science, will speak. That will be followed on October 5th by Jonathan Terhorst, who's new faculty in the Department of Statistics here at U of M. And then on October 12th by Yang Chen, also on faculty in the Department of Statistics. Um, here at the university, and uh, they will all be speaking on various aspects of data science that uh, you should find illuminating and uh, informational. Beyond the seminar series, we have a number of MITA-sponsored activities that are educational in nature that are coming up that uh, students in data science, whether you're undergraduate or graduate, uh, should find uh, interesting and useful. Next Monday and Tuesday, September 24 and 25 at 4.30 p.m., there will be information sessions on graduate studies in both computation and uh, data sciences. So um, there will be information shared about a PhD program and then uh, two uh, graduate certificate um, programs in the, those respective areas. Then coming up on Friday, uh, October 5, uh, one of the uh, student organizations uh, that uh, Midas uh, uh, supports, uh, the Statistics in the Community, or STATCOM, is holding its fall meeting, and that will be held over in the School of Public Health. And then lastly, um, if you're not already aware, want to make everybody um, um, aware that uh, Midas is holding its fourth annual symposium with a theme of serving society through data science. That will be held Monday and Tuesday, October 8 and 9. Would encourage all of you to um, uh, go online and register and attend the event where we will have four invited speakers from across the country, 12 research talks by um, our colleagues um, uh, here at the university and more than 80 posters featuring data science that is happening uh, here at the university. So getting back to the reason that we're all here today, um, uh, Ivo Dinoff um, is going to be speaking on the agnomatic time, uh, time complexity uh, in data science. Uh, Dr. Dinoff is a professor of health behavior and biological sciences in the School of Nursing. He's also professor of computational medicine and bioinformatics in the medical school. And last but not least, he's our associate director for education and training in the Michigan Institute for Data Science. So when you have a question about the certificate program, Evo's your go-to guy uh, to get those things um, answered. So um, as many of you may be aware, uh, Evo directs the statistics online computational resource here at the University of Michigan, also known as soccer. He uh, also directs the integrative biostatistics and informatics core of the Michigan Nutrition and Obesity Research Center. He um, also directs the Udall Parkinson's Disease Biostatistics and Data Management Corps, co-directs the Center for Complexity and Self-Management of Chronic Disease, and last but not least, um, co-directs the Multi-Institutional Probability Distributum um, uh, Project. Uh, Evo is a member of several professional societies, including the American Statistical Association, uh, the International Statistical Education Association 
AMIA and uh, um, the American Association for the Advancement of Science and an elected member of the Institutional Statistics Institute. So with that all said, I'm sure he will have many practical examples today to talk about time complexity in data science. And so before I turn uh, today's uh, activity over to um, Evo, I'd like to acknowledge um, the um, corporate sponsorship of, of Vacher, Kemi, and Northrop Grumman for the generous support um, of the MITA seminars series. So with that, Eva will turn it over to you. Thank you, Kevin. And thank you, everybody, for showing up today. Um, uh, for the folks that are uh, joining online, uh, welcome to you as well. So today, I'm hoping to take you on, a, on an interesting journey that's going to uh, uh, take three parts. In, in part one, uh, I'm going to talk about some of the uh, some of the motivational challenges. Then I'm going to show some of the math and physics, and then I'm going to the applications. But before I dive in, I just want to acknowledge that uh, this is joint work with one of my colleagues, um, a very bright young uh, scholar, Milan Velev at Burgas Technical University. And um, if anybody is interested in seeing these slides, just Google Soccer News, go to today's events, and you can find the, the slides uh, available online. So uh, let's look at the talk outline. As I mentioned, it will have three uh, uh, very complementary but very distinct at the same time synergistic components to it. I'm going to start in the very beginning uh, formulating the need and giving you examples of what are large and complex biomedical data sets. Then we're going to do a few uh, concept definitions that are going to drive what's going to come up later on. In the middle, we're going to uh, spend a little bit of time going back to uh, our uh, you know, back in time and back to our undergraduate studies, we're going to talk about some of the fundamentals of mathematical physics. And then using these, we're going to define the concept of complex time, something that we refer to as time. And then at the very end, uh, the last one third is going to be dedicated to actually up applying some of these strategies into specific uh, data sets that come in this realm. So let's start off with uh, big biomedical and health data sets. What are these? Uh, why are they needed? How do they come about? So let me first point out this cartoon that I, that I drew that kind of represents uh, the three basic uh, uh, threads in, in scientific investigation that's experimental and data driven. <coughs> On the left panel, you have essentially um, native processes, uh, natural phenomena that people want to study, they want to model, they want to interrogate. And most of the time what we do is we essentially acquire in a clever way sample data and we consider the data to be representative of the underlying population. And then we do analytics on these kinds of data. And there is pros and cons to each of these approaches. Now, obviously, if you want to do a census-wide complete uh, a population snapshot at any one time, these things are uncontrollable. They're not perfectly observable. You've got problems here. And if you go in that case, the sample may require a lot of assumptions. Uh, it may be quite representative. It may miss some. Uh, atypical observations and so forth. So that's why we want to live in this space that's kind of in between that tries to translate some of these challenges that we see at the two extremes into different challenges. Challenges that are, that are related to data handling, data aggregation, harmonization, and so forth. So we're going to be in this space right up here in between um, the real uh, spaces and the, uh, and the sample data. So uh, let's start off. Uh, we all are familiar with the term big data came about a decade ago or so. IBM and other investigators qualitatively described big data as the four Vs. You know, you've got the volume, you've got the variety, you've got the velocity, you've got the veracity, and people have extended that there's seven and eight Vs now. There's lots of Vs, okay? In our world, we have tried to come up with a definition that's constructive in nature and points out the specific limitations of the current knowledge, specific tools and uh, technologies that need to be developed to handle all of this. So I want to show you these um, seven core characteristics that we've identified by looking at many, many dozens of biomedical and health challenges. The first one, obviously, where the name comes from is the size. All, all the time, this data is voluminous. We know that. But it's not just the volume. It's the complexity. It's the heterogeneity of the data. It's the file formats that need to be handled. You know, uh, some are streamed, some are static. Uh, you know, so, so th there, is, there is a lot of complexities that come with these types of data. Um, they're most of the time incongruent, so you need to develop tools that allow you to do that harmonization and aggregation. Virtually all the time, big biomedical data comes from multiple sources that use completely independent and distinct 
data representations or bases for representing the data. And these independent resources, they're not designed to interoperate. So that's a big challenge. You need to find mechanisms to actually handle these types of data. Very often, the data is multi-scale. It can go from the macroscopic to the mesoscale to the microscale down to the nanoscale. And uh, everybody who's done any computational uh, statistics would know that doing analytics on data that's uh, hierarchical, multi-resolution is, is very, very difficult. One important characteristic that we're going to be spending a lot of time today on is the notion of time. Most of the time the data has longitudinal aspects that need to be accounted for somehow because of the autocorrelation that's embedded in some of these longitudinal aspects. So that represents a significant barrier. And last but certainly not least, this data is never complete. I've never in my life seen a complete data set uh, that comes up. So, you know, there is, there is need to, for, do, for imputation, for handling some of these missing data. And on the right panel here, I'm just showing you one, one example where uh, we and others have looked at thousands and tens of thousands of, of patients that have uh, many, many uh, tens of thousands and sometimes hundreds of thousands of features that are either observed, derived, computed, all kinds of observations, and we need to make some kind of an inference, right? So um, let's go ahead and, and do two very specific definitions. Uh, there is about 60 or 70 of us here. If I ask any one of us, we're going to have our own definition of data science. Here is my definition of data science. Very, very transdisciplinary area that uh, pushes and pulls uh, developments in a multitude of disciplines like theoretical, computational, experimental, and applied uh, disciplines. Uh, it deals always with enormous amounts of information and aims to develop aggregate ensemble algorithms that actually uh, can be used to derive semi-automated decision support systems that can augment human intelligence in a way. That's the point of data science. Now, predictive analytics on the other hand side is the process that's used uh, to employ data science technique and, uh, and, uh, and advanced mathematical formulations, powerful statistical computing uh, technologies and algorithms, uh, distributed web services, etc., to interrogate such a data set. And predictive analytics always aims to either provide some kind of a forecast, uh, provide a, a cluster, identify uh, hidden latent phenotypes, or um, uh, uh, extrapolate knowledge outside of the immediate uh, scope or the manifold that the data is actually acquired in. So these are the characteristics of the data, but what are the challenges that are associated with it? So let me give you a couple of examples. The first one comes from um, uh, uh, a study of uh, Alzheimer's disease. So here we've used uh, data acquired by the, internet, by the national consortium called Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative. By now they have many, many thousands of individuals three, four years ago, uh, all the data that we can pull in that had substantial amount of information that was useful uh, uh, was about 800 individuals. They were subdivided into three different groups, the patients, the asymptomatic age match, match controls, and then these people that are kind of in between, mildly impaired individuals that don't quite have dementia yet, but they have some of the symptoms. So what we had to do, the challenge in this, in this specific project was to uh, establish homologies between the imaging and genetics data. And we, we all know this is difficult, even in the case of the genomic sequences, where one can actually do the imputation, do the alignment, but these are acquired in small fragments. So putting it all together as an end-to-end -end, uh, genome sequence that's mapped to, to certain quote-unquote atlas, human genome atlas, is difficult. In the brain case, you obviously know that human brains are incredibly diverse. Some people miss sauci. It, you know, establishing homologies between them so that you can do your statistics is extremely difficult. So our approach has been to take the data, parcelate it, then for each of these parcelated regions, we extract morphometry measures that are of interest, and now all of a sudden these brains can be put aside, and we simply deal with, uh, with signature vectors that are in perfect homology, and they, they have the same representation in terms of the region of interest and the morphometry measure that we compute for uh, for each of these regions across individuals. Now, more generally speaking, every single computational neuroscience project that I've seen always has these four components. It starts with bits and bytes, large amounts, extremely heterogeneous formats. Um, data needs to be aggregated, scrubbed, uh, pre-processed, and then all of a sudden we begin to reconstruct data. So, for instance, 
magnetic resonance imaging data is always obtained in the Fourier domain. It needs to be inverted. These slices now need to be reconstructed as three-dimensional solids. Out of these solids, we need to come up with algorithms to extract cortical surfaces, which are not observable directly. They need to be inferred from the, fr fr from the lattice data that we have using various sophisticated manifold extraction algorithms. And once you have that information, you begin to look for knowledge. So you begin the parcellations of the brain, you begin the modeling of their boundaries of these three-dimensional solids as two-dimensional manifolds. And now once you have the manifold representations, you can do computing on it, right? Once we have all of this, obviously this is not just done for the fun of it. What you want to do is you want to have some action. You want to be able to use these things to predict clinical outcomes, forecast the progression of the disease on an individual or population level, or perhaps uh, suggest appropriate uh, treatment regimens depending upon the condition. One other uh, driving motivational challenge that I want to show you before I go in the, into the methods part of the talk is the study of a longitudinal study of amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, very debilitating, extremely debilitating progressive neurodegenerative disorder. So we and thousands of other individuals across the globe has used this database called PROACT, which is a, a European uh, clinical trials for AOS. It has over uh, 8,600 individuals in it and uh, over 24 to 2,500 clinically derived uh, uh, metrics that the physicians uh, obtain by examining the individuals. The basic two questions that we are interested in is first of all, uh, identify salient features 25, 2,500 features. Obviously, nobody can keep at the same time all this information in their head. Two, three, maybe four features at a time you might be able to comprehend, but uh, uh, thousands is very difficult. So we're trying to identify salient features that are highly predictive, for instance, of how rapidly these individuals are gonna progress or how likely they are to remain fairly stable over a one year period of time. The second question that we wanted to answer was we wanted to have a decision tree prediction uh, support system that will allow us to use the baseline information for these individuals and three month follow up to predict all the way up prospectively the 12 month outcomes, clinical outcomes for these individuals. So after many, many years, three to four years of pounding on these data, again, there have been hundreds of publications on, the, on this data set. Nobody has been able to pull out anything that exceeds 75% accuracy, maybe 78, you know, between 70 and 80%. It's a very difficult data set. So we developed our own algorithm, very complicated algorithm, and uh, you may or, or may not be able to see here, but the algorithm starts on the very top with, um, you know, the original data set, uh, what kind of method is applied, what kind of comes out of it, and then it goes through uh, the corresponding, you know, data wrangling methods, including uh, handling the missing cases. Then it goes through model-based and model-free uh, techniques for uh, representation and prediction. And once you have the different kinds of predictions, obviously you're gonna be doing some kind of an assessment to find out, is this worthwhile? Is this reliable? Uh, this is always done, obviously, on testing cases, so we've got uh, uh, training cases and testing independent sets of data that you're gonna that are gonna tell you how good is your algorithm on unseen uh, data. So the variable importance plot uh, that's on the background shows the results for just one of these uh, machine learning methods, uh, methods, something called uh, Bayesian adaptive regression trees. And again, th this kind of shows uh, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, rank ordered features. Uh, the longer the horizontal bar is, the more important the feature is always relative to, to the next one. And you can see that, uh, you know, the importance of these features is gonna be decreasing. So looking at something like this, a physician can actually make a decision on which of these features may be appropriate to look at initially at least. Now, looking at the validation results at the end, they're not impressive. In fact, they're weak, okay? And I am telling you that these may not be the best results, but these are not the worst results either. Th these are right here in between. So for instance, if you look at our top performer, the Bayesian Adaptive Regression Tree uh, Classifier. Uh, the correlation at the end of where we predicted the 12th month um, uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis rating scale for this individual to be, once we've only looked at baseline and, and third month, predicting the 12th month, the correlation between the true and the predicted is only about 0.5. It's not close to 0 0.8, 0 0.91, you know. So this is kind of weak, right? So this basically says one of two things. Either we're not looking at the right data, 
or alternatively, we need more sensitive algorithms. That's why I'm showing this example. We actually have better results, but I wanted to show you this example as a driving motivation of uh, what's coming up. So that's part one. Now in part two, I want to uh, get a little bit technical, so I, so I do uh, uh, hope that I can keep most of your attention here because there will be a few formulae that are going to sprinkle in and it may get a little bit boring, uh, but I promise you, I do need to get through this to show the applications, otherwise it's not going to make any sense to show the results and the applications unless we know how are these techniques working in practice. So let's begin it. Uh, so I'm going to show you four or five uh, basic methods that we're going to be using. Uh, the first thing that uh, most of us have at least heard of is something called the Fourier transform. So uh, it's an incredible feat of ingenuity of how this was realized by the French mathematician or polymath uh, Fourier. So the basic idea is that uh, every time you have some kind of a data that's acquired in space-time, you can represent it in the frequency domain. And by the way, uh, it is a little known fact that your brains do this thing live on the time all the time. Because right now when I project my voice, this is essentially translated uh, in terms of wavelengths into your brain. Your brain inverts the, the, the Fourier transform and actually recognizes these expressions as words. And then you can respond back and the same thing happens. So our brains, when two or three people are talking, you can untangle whose voice and kind of only tune in to listen to one person versus the next. So it's an incredible uh, phenomenon that can be mathematically explained just like it says up here. Uh, and this is stated in the, in the case that I would need to refer to later on for space-time defined functions. So for these functions f that are defined on Minkowski space-time, you know, so here's my function. If I integrate it against an exponential complex valued kernel of this type, where the, uh, the parameters of this exponential include both the angular frequency and the space frequency, the corresponding integral is what's referred to as the Fourier transform. And the inverse Fourier transform uh, is exactly the same operation. Now, this time it's applied on the uh, frequency uh, level function, except that we take the complex conjugate of the corresponding kernel, right? So, so we integrate against the uh, exponential with, with a minus exponent here. And obviously, you know, there are theorems about how these things uh, play in practice. Um, for those of you that are interested in seeing these hands-on, we have developed a very, very cute little Java applet that shows that phenomenon of translating a one-dimensional signal into the Fourier domain and what is the effect of, the, of manipulating the signal in the Fourier domain back, what's the effect of that manipulation back on the, on the, on the time-space signal. So right up here is a signal that you can draw with your mouse if you, if you go to this website and you have a Java-enabled browser. You can draw a little signal here and it uh, automatically projects for you the magnitudes and the phases of the uh, corresponding Fourier transform. The magnitudes are nothing and I forgot to say that the Fourier transform is intrinsically by definition complex valued. So it's got a real part, and an imaginary part. And if you take these two parts, square them out, add them together, and take a square root, that's the magnitude of the Fourier transform. And if you take arc tangent of the imaginary over the real part, then you get the corresponding phases. So um, once, you, once you transform the original time varying signal into this uh, frequency decomposition, you can manipulate every one of these little tones, frequencies, or the phases, and you're going to see the effect these yellow curves, I'm not sure if the colors are actually showing well, but this is the yellow curve that I was manipulating to get uh, the oscillatory wave pattern that's uh, not compactly supported but certainly goes across the, sp the spectrum on the top. Anyway, so that's a one-dimensional example. Let me show you a two-dimensional example which points out something that we're going to be harping on quite a bit uh, later on. So on the left part, I'm going to start with a very simple square image, right? Uh, black everywhere except in the middle I have a, a, a solid uh, square and then I'm gonna go ahead and apply the Fourier transform because it's complex valued and I want to display it as an image I'm gonna take the real part of it and that's what it looks like the real part of the Fourier transform and then I can plot its two important components the magnitude and the phases right so here are my magnitudes and phases and I can do the very same operation for the solid disk which is somewhat same topology you know, the geometry is slightly different, but the topology of these two sets are the same. And obviously you can see that there are sim some similarities and some differences between the Fourier space representation and the, uh, between the two different signals. So now what I'm interested in doing is I'm interested in examining exactly what is the impact of playing around 
with the phases. So on the bottom row here, I'm going to start with my uh, original signal and I'm just going to invert the Fourier transform and I get what I'm expecting to get. I'm expecting to get exactly the same signal that I started off with. But if I invert the wavelet transform but I don't use the magnitude and phase of the square itself, if I swap the phase by the phase of the disk, right, is that right here with me? And then I invert the Fourier transform, I get an image like this. If I do the same thing, but I pretend that the phase is unknown. Why? You'll see in a second why you need to assume these things. If you assume the phase is unknown, unobserved, then the reconstructed image looks like this. Now, in both of these cases, you can see the resemblance, right? There is quite a bit of resemblance. If you do exactly the same thing for the solid disk, you invert the solid disk, you use the disk magnitudes, but you swap the disk phases by the square phases, you get this image. And if you uh, negate completely, if you uh, nullate the uh, phases and you reconstruct the, the disk, you get something that does look like, like a disk with a little halo around it. So the point that we're going to be making across this is that most of the time we make inference on data sets that look exactly like that, okay? But the inference about the objects that are doing are things that look like this. Okay, so that's what the exploration that we're going to be doing. We're going to play this game where the question is how can we imagine having a, a, a whole bunch of cases like this stacked together and you're trying to make the inference, essentially reconstruct for instance, the right signal. And what are the pros and cons of doing this? So that's the first important thing that I wanted to mention, the notion of the Fourier transform between space and frequency. The second important concept that I need is the notion of wave functions. And again, you'll see very shortly why is this important. So uh, for simplicity, we're going to consider the, the simple one-dimensional space plus time um, uh, wave functions. So they're most of the time represented as complex valued amplitude and phases. And they're essentially potential functions. They're solutions to various diffusion equations like this one. Now, for uh, wave functions themselves are not measurable, OK, but they satisfy equations, for example, just like the Schrodinger's equation, okay? And there is two ways to represent these, these, these wave functions. One is called the Schrodinger picture that was derived after the, the Heisenberg's uh, uh, picture derivation, but it uses essentially calculus, it uses PD. And the Heisenberg's picture is an algebraic uh, definition where you use operators instead. So there is this very interesting dichotomy between observable quantities, x, and linear operators that are paired in a one-to-one -one correspondence with observables. So for every x, there is an x hat. And this x hat acts on the wave function by, by taking all the, wa the wave states and generating new states for every one of these. Um, there could be infinitely, uncountably many states. So uh, the importance here is that for every me measurable instance, when you actually observe one measurable thing, it corresponds to operator expectation. And these operator expectations can be defined uh, by, uh, uh, in, in terms of matrix multiplication of the corresponding operator by the wave function on the left and on the right, by the wave function and its complex conjugate. And once you have the expectation, just like we do in standard statistics, you can derive the uncertainty, the dispersion, if you wish, by taking the expectation of the operator, subtract the weights, mean, quote unquote, expectation, which is a constant in this case. And that will be a representation for quantifying the uncertainty of observing specific uh, observable with a specific value. The two examples that most of the time people uh, keep in mind is the uh, position momentum. So the position operator is identical uh, to x. So the operator that corresponds to the position is just x. The operator that co corresponds to the momentum is just a, a partial derivative with respect to x. And then if you look at this commutator that's in the uh, uh, Heisenberg's picture here representation, if this commutator is trivial, then you know that these two observables can be uh, detected simultaneously with infinite precision. If, like in the situation of the position momentum, uh, these two observables have a commutator that's strictly non-trivial, then you know that uh, there is a limit as to how, uh, how accurate the position and the momentum of any particle can be determined, uh, which is obviously the Heisenberg's inequality. 
So let me just show you some, some diagrams that kind of show wave functions in reality. So we all tend to think about wave functions like this, right? Oscillatory uh, amplitude patterns in a two-dimensional projection planes. But in reality, what they are is there this um, constant amplitude and varying phase objects. And you can see that here the coloring is indicating precisely the phase identifier. Where are you in this minus pi to pi or 0 to 2 pi location across the, the, the fixed phase. And then if you were to project that, that spiral, that corkscrew, if you were to project it in the back planes, as you can see, you see exactly the pattern that we typically associate with waves. The next important uh, definition that I want to remind you of is uh, an incredible theory that these two guys, um, uh, Kaluza and Klein, developed uh, about 100 years ago. They wanted to see if um, Einstein's general relativity theory, which is defined by default in space time, in four dimensional Minkowski space, can be extended one extra dimension. So they uh, did that, uh, both uh, uh, Kaluza and Klein did that, and they were able to prove all the field equations. The, 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 the theory works in five dimensions as well. Uh, but the topology of this space is kind of strange, right? It is strange because Turns out, if you pick a point uh, in, in M4, which is Minkowski space-time, uh, then at every one of these points, you do have a direction, but the direction is so small, it's below the Planck constant, so you can't really traverse this circle. You do have the directions associated with that location, but there is no way to traverse the circle. It's so small, it's beyond uh, the reasonable recognition. So that is an interesting space, and, and, and we're going to make a, a big deal out of this uh, when we do the data analytics. So non-traversable non S1 for, for a unitary circle. So phi is going to represent the phase at location M4, and M4 is a three space plus one time, which is going to correspond to the order of the events. So now we are ready to define this notion of uh, complex time, or something that we call kind. So, Let's look at the, um, at the uh, uh, space kind manifold first. It's a five-dimensional manifold uh, that can be indexed by the three dimensions of space that we all know, and then two dimensions uh, in time. Okay, they're going to be called in Cartesian coordinates x4 and x5, and you see later we, we're going to talk about different formulations. So in that five-dimensional space kind manifold, we're going to define k events, complex events, and these complex events are going to have the notion of three important characteristics. First of all, where is the k event occurring in space? So x, y, and z. The second important characteristic is what is the causal longitudinal order of this specific event? That's going to be the r. And then the third important characteristic is essentially what is the direction? What's the face of this, of this k event? So these three characteristics would define the extension of what we typically know as e events into the k events for complex events. So it turns out we can introduce exactly the same generalization of the Minkowski uh, 5 by 5 metric tensor in the most general curved space time. The tensor is going to look like this. In the simplest of all cases is when we're talking about a flat space, okay? And the Euclidean representation of space time is going to have this simple tensor. Off diagonal elements are going to be trivial. The on diagonal elements are going to have positive sign for the three spatial uh, directions and negative signs for the, for the two uh, complex time directions. Depending upon um, whether the, uh, the tensor is positive, negative, definite, or, or uh, equal to zero, this leads to three different space-like, space light-like, and kind-like intervals in that 5D space kind manifold. So in terms of notations, it is important to understand that there is, as we all know, multiple ways to parameterize spaces. So I'm just talking about a two-dimensional time space, obviously the Cartesian ways. One of these things we've all, we all are familiar with uh, polar coordinate representations. There is also conjugate pairs representation. And there is uncountably many, in fact, representations that you can find. These are the most common ones that we're going to be switching back and forth depending upon what's more convenient in terms of the representation. Most of the time, we're going to be working right up here in polar coordinates because this has the nice representation where the R corresponds exactly to standard time, and theta would correspond to this new notion of uh, phase of time. For the folks that are a little bit more geometric in their perception, I've drawn this 
diagram that kind of shows uh, space time. So here is the, the space is just the axis of symmetry of these cones. And then you have these points in that space that uh, obviously uh, uh, indicate the specific two-dimensional uh, kind coordinates. So here is one that has R1 and phi1 at location x. And there is a parallel point right up here, a different space in time that has identical coordinates, but there is one that has completely different coordinates. So that's one way to visually represent this uh, space time. So uh, before I go into the translation now of this theory into data sciences, I want to tell you that, yes, we've gone through and we've, we've, we've generalized some of the math that goes with, with these transformations. I'll just give you two examples. The first one is uh, the Lorentz transformation between two reference frames in Cartesian coordinates. So here is reference frame one, here is a reference frame two. Here is the corresponding, we've derived the uh, Lorentz transformation. We also have a Lorentz transformation in polar coordinates. We've also done the uh, Wertinger derivatives, derivatives in terms of time, not in terms of time. And here is the representation, for example, of the time acceleration, again stated explicitly in uh, polar coordinates. It's got two real and imaginary parts. And then we've done many, many others, including uh, how are uh, the law of addition of velocities, energy momentum conservation laws, um, uh, etc., including the causal structure of space and time. We've generalized these things as well. So the question is, this is all nice and dandy, but where is the data and where is the data science? Well, to get to the data science, I need to draw some parallels now between concepts in math physics and data science. So the first thing that I want to start is a particle, what physics is called particle. In our case, it's going to be an object. What a physicist call observable, in our case, is going to be in data science, is called feature. Uh, particle state is a single datum point. Uh, particle systems, as a collection of, of independent objects, is essentially an analytical problem. Uh, wave functions get translated into inference functions. And I'll, the next slide is going to explain exactly what this means. Reference frame transformation, just like the Lorentz transformation that I just showed you in the data science domain are represented as data transformations, and there is many, many, many of those. Um, state of systems uh, get translated into complete data sets that data scientists observe, record, and process. And then uh, whether or not the particle system is computable gets translated in data science into the, into the terms of whether the data object can be constructed in such a way that an algorithm can actually be applied to it. Do I have a computable object? And I told you, it's difficult to get from raw data to computable data simply because they are acquired in different bases. There is no way to do joint understanding of these data sets unless you have a mechanism of making them computable. So let's spend very little time here specifically focusing on the dichotomy between wave functions in physics and inference functions in data science. I'll just show you a couple of examples. Suppose I'm trying to fit in a generalized linear model to a data set that consists of some covariates, predictors x, and some clearly defined supervised outcome y. Uh, we are all familiar with uh, ordinary least squares. I can take my design matrix and my output, and I can put it in this ordinary least squares formula. And now here, all of a sudden, my inference function, again, I'm, we're going to use the same lowercase Greek letters to indicate uh, uh, wave functions in physics and inference functions in data science. So my, my inference function takes in this uh, object, observable data, O, uh, and then generates the inference, which is the effect sizes in a very simple, very simple model-based uh, classical, traditional inference case. Now, for these betas, obviously, we do statistical testing. We compute p-values. We declare some significance, some not. So this is an example of how we translate uh, uh, the simple generalized linear model representation into inference functions. The slightly more intricate is the non-parametric, uh, non-linear case. Suppose I'm trying to do support vector machine classification. Uh, so I typically start with uh, uh, a lifting function, some kind of a phi in, in a Hilbert space, that essentially maps the data from its native lower dimensional space into a higher dimensional space in such a way that this, this kernel function, this lifting function, uh, take, uh, acts as an inner product. So given two data sets, it essentially 
generates a real value that's an inner product of the two observations. And then the uh, SVM prediction operator that actually gives you the inference at the end that separates the data into different separate clusters um, uh, can be computed using, using these functions according to this formula. So you have uh, an inner product representation, again, of the inference in terms of the uh, corresponding solutions of the SVM regularization. Just like um, in the physics domain, um, the particle location can be only probabilistically inferred. In our case, uh, the inference, the statistical inference, the data science inference, uh, the predictions are always defined uh, in a probabilistic sense as well. Right? So anybody who's done any machine learning knows that at the end if you do prediction, you can actually compute the posterior probabilities of how likely is the outcome to be part of class A, B, or C. So again, for the folks that are a little bit more diagrammatic, this schematic kind of shows uh, where we are going. But the first thing that I want to point out is that we can observe uh, data uh, directly in space time. Many, many a times, it's just not tractable to observe data. However, what we can uh, measure fairly accurately is the uh, uh, event order aspect of time, namely the first, the radius coordinate, uh, because it's, it's time and, and that's, that's something that we most of the time control. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be applying a little trick that crystallographers have used for many, many decades, right? They want to know the crystal structure of very, very small uh, objects, okay? And how do they do that? Well, they bombard them with high energy particles and on the back they look at the diffraction pattern the problem, the problem is that they can only retrieve the magnitudes, so the data is acquired intrinsically in the frequency domain. But what they observe in the frequency domain is just the magnitudes of the, uh, of the frequency. They cannot get their hands on the uh, exact uh, uh, phases. So there is several approaches that would allow you to still make inference about the crystal structure on an angstrom level. So here is one reference if anybody wants to go deeper. The first one is that you can look at prior information about the kind phase or the kind direction. Uh, you can use uh, different data sets. You can use a phase aggregator. That's what I'm going to be showing you examples of. I'm going to be using different data sets to guesstimate the phase and I'm going to de design very simple aggregator functions like means. You can, you can design all kinds of geometric means if you want, medians. Anybody can come up with an aggregator phase function that can be used to estimate the phase. And then what's essentially ha uh, happening is that if the data is observed right up here, the spatial coordinates could be either observed or computed. Uh, most of the time in the time space we only observe time. The phase needs to be estimated. So we're going to be inverting that back and, uh, and, and computing essentially the five-dimensional space-time structure. And that's where the analytics are going to be. So we're going to be going back and forth using the Fourier transform trying to enhance the signal effectively in such a way that we can argue unequivocally that the inference that is obtained by looking at the data uh, originally and the data that's acquired through that phase aggregation are different. A picture is worth how many words? A thousand <laughs> words, so let, let's just look at one picture here. So this is real data. This is real data acquired using functional magnetic resonance imaging. So what's happening here is I've simply extracted a single slice. So fMRI is always four dimensional, okay? But I've cut one two dimensional slice and now I have this slice across time and that's what you see as these tunnels here. I've simply stretched and, I'm, and I have, it's difficult to visualize three dimensional solids, right? So what I visualize here is these isosurfaces can everybody picture it? So I've got my three-dimensional tube of data solid. You can see through it. You, you can use volumetric rendering, but it's not going to be as um, uh, uh, structured. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to construct isosurfaces at different intensity levels, and we want to see how these isosurfaces propagate across time. And now on the left-hand side is what you would always see, okay? On the right-hand side is so on the left-hand side, you have this assuming the phases are unknown. And on the right-hand side, you have the very same data set with the very same magnitudes, except that the phases are correctly identified. Look, there are similarities and there is differences between these two, right? The similarities are obviously, I can see the ventricular system right here, right in the middle. This, the dark region is the, is the ventricles. I can see it clearly. I can see some of the interesting 
patterns that I still might statistically infer that an activation occurs in this brain region when I do finger opposition, right? I can see these, these areas where there seems to be something going on, okay? Uh, but on the uh, perfect image, imagine now having a whole bunch of these for 100 individuals or maybe the same individual repeated over time. If I were to make inference on this, I'm going to identify some, some, I guess, locations where uh, the stimulus that was applied during the fMRI scan might have activated the brain regions. But I may have a lot of false positives or false negatives simply because the image, the, the reconstructed signal is not as crisp as the one that we see once we reconstruct it perfectly, right? Is that what I see? So they're very similar, but not quite. So we're going to be exploring this. So that's the middle part. And now we're going to go into the applications in the remaining 10-15 uh, minutes. So one, uh, 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 I guess, textbook example, simple example. Suppose my, observer, my observed data are in, in the right column. Uh, and what I'm interested in is I'm, uh, I'm interested in looking at two different alphabets, but I want to uh, play the game where I swap the phases, right? Obviously, I want to make inference on these. They're not observable. Typically, what's observable is this or that. And then I want to make an inference. Now, obviously, you see the reason why I wanted to show this example is the intricate swapping in the middle. If you guys pay a little bit of attention, the Cyrillic alphabets were predominantly and more CRISPR uh, realized in the English alphabet reconstruction, and the English alphabet was predominantly realized in the reconstruction of the Cyrillic letters if you swap the phases. So this kind of tells you that you can't completely ignore the phases. There is a lot of information that is in there. Um, now, if you were to do statistics on these guys versus these guys, you may or may not be getting the same things. So coming back to the fMRI data, because I do want to show a real fMRI uh, analytic example, uh, this illustrates the um, uh, cross-sectioning of, uh, again, a single, uh, a single spatial two-dimensional axial projection plane of the fMRI signal at three different time points, point one, point two, and point three, rendered, um, again, as surfaces. And you can see that these are interested, interesting. So what I want to do now is I want to just focus on one location across all of these, and there is 180 time points. And I want to try to find out what's really happening with this signal. So I'm going to be reconstructing this uh, uh, single uh, time location right up here. And the black curve indicates the actual observed fMRI signal. And the red dash curve um, illustrates the reconstructed uh, signal where the null phase um, is uh, used. So you only use the time information. It works pretty OK, right? Uh, misses some things. Other places, it's kind of OK. But if you look at the correlation between the two time series, it's 1.6, uh, 0 0.16, OK? If you go ahead now and use an aggregate phase reconstruction strategy, for instance, I'm going to use uh, another voxel in the brain. I just pick another location in the brain where the two time series of the two locations were highly correlated. Well, how, high, how highly correlated? Well, 0.7 correlation right up here. So I'm picking another location in the brain, and I'm using these phases to reconstruct the original time series. And now this is the red curve here. And you can see that this is a lot better reconstruction. It still misses some places. It, it's OK other places. But look at the correlation now. The correlation jumps from 0 0.16 to 0 0.79. Now, obviously, if I were to do inference on the two time series that you see on the back panel and on the front panel, you're more likely to get representative inference if you use the front panel where some kind of a phase aggregation took place. Um, the next example um, now it begins to go into the real situation because this is still not real. This is, it's real data, but it's, it's mostly simulated. In this specific case, I'm using um, air quality data set that has about uh, 9,300 uh, uh, hourly average estimates of carbon monoxide, for example. But that's going to be a very interesting study. I'll tell you why. Because I'm going to be doing real analytics on it using exogenous feature time series analysis. Okay? So, and I've shown just here, you know, on, on the horizontal axis, you have the time, the event order, the R parameter in the time space. And on the vertical, you have the concentration of the carbon monoxide. So what I want to do now is I want to go ahead and uh, reconstruct this data in two different ways. 
The first one on, on the first panel is most of the time what you're going to be observing. Uh, uh, then here is the original data. And here is the one that I use the average over multiple epochs of, of the same data set. And I want to discuss a little bit some of these results. So these exogenous feature time series analysis allow you to do classical uh, autoregressive integrated moving average time series analysis with the extra uh, benefit of including exogenous variables in the time series model. Okay? Now these exogenous variables are listed right up here. They start, there is 11 of them listed right up here. Okay? They're going to play a role in explaining the carbon monoxide level across time. Uh, and you start, begin to look now. Okay, so the ARIMA model that was fit on the original data has, has the uh, order of the time legs equals to 1. The second parameter is the difference in the number of past values that are going to be subtracted from each value, 1. And the third parameter is the skew, which uh, indicates the order of uh, the, uh, the uh, moving average parameter, how many of the, neighboring, uh, 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 of the neighbors need to be averaged to generate uh, the uh, intensity at that specific location. Uh, if I ignore the phases completely, I have a slightly different model. The P is 2, the D is 0, and uh, the Q is, in this case, 1. And if you use the average over multiple epochs of, of this specific data set, I get a model that has parameters 2, 0, and 3. So three completely different models. Now, let's look at the highlighted results here. Because these highlighted results allow you to do inference. The ones that are in, in orange are places where the coefficients associated with the autoregressive, the moving average, the intercept, or the exogenous variables are closer in the um, phase aggregation model compared to the no phase model. Okay? So these are, these are the uh, orange colored. And you can see that this model obviously looks a little bit closer to the real model up here. Right? Look, at, look at the number of, uh, for example, this doesn't have moving average 2 and moving average 3 in the new model. And then these coefficients are much closer to the real ones. But one surprising fact is that if you look at the AIC, the Akaike information criteria for these models, uh, obviously the true model is uh, about 10,000. The new model is 13,000. And the model that I'm arguing should be better is a lot larger, 14,000. Now, the AIC, which is smaller, would typically indicate a better model. So how can we explain that? And at the first glance, this sounds a little counterintuitive, right? You have, visually speaking, a model that resembles the real thing better. But according to the information criteria, it performs worse. And the reason why it performs worse is that the new model actually is models completely different system. It fits in the completely different system much better, but it has no relevance to reality. So it, it is a very interesting uh, example in this case where you can actually argue that AIC by itself is not the gold standard. Sometimes higher AICs are actually better. But this is about the past. Now let's look about forecasting the future using this very same data set. So what I want to do is I want to learn on the first 1,000 time points, and I want to forecast the next 50 points okay, using all three models. So uh, this may be difficult to see, but here, here is the original signal chugging along. And, and I kind of chopped it off. You know, it, it starts obviously with 1, and it goes to 1,000 for the, for the learning phase. The important thing is right from here on the next 50 points, I have the, um, the original is in black. The, um, uh, the prediction of the time series using the no phases is in purple, right up here. The red shows the prediction using the aggregate phase model, using averaging um, uh, across the phases. The green one is the real uh, carbon monoxide uh, time series at the second epoch. So this is not observed. We haven't trained the model. This is the reality of the situation, is the green one. And then the blue, along with the shaded area, is the actual time series model, the ARIMA model that we derived from the true, from the true data set is in the, in the shaded kind of bluish color. So albeit this may be hard to see, I want to point out to you that the correlations between the original um, the true, 
the true uh, time course and the uh, model that's used that's using uh, new phase uh, predictions is only 0 0.076. Uh, the predictions that using the averages is about 0.3. Uh, and, and it's much better, obviously, than um, uh, the uh, model that does not have the additional uh, phase information. So that's one evidence of how these things can be used in practice. The secondary completely independent uh, analytics of the very same data uses a different algorithm, uses the least absolute shrinkage and selection operator, something that's called regularized regression. So on the very first uh, row here, you got the new phase reconstructed uh, lasso coefficients, as well as the correct true phases. The second row shows the uh, mean square error for both models. And the last one shows the regression coefficients. And you can see that you know, uh, the first one essentially tells you, yeah, the coefficients are much larger for the incorrect model. That's good. The second one tells you that you need, if you're using the incorrect model, you need all the, tw all the 12 exogenous variables to explain the uh, observed carbon monoxide series. Whereas um, uh, in the true model, you only need about six or so coefficients to explain that. And finally, if you look at the magnitudes of the lasso coefficients, they're all over the place and much larger in size if you use an incorrect uh, reconstruction of the signal versus look at how tight most of the exogenous variables are essentially trivial with just a few that are kind of large, which kind of tells you that you can explain with a few exogenous variables the time course of some of these series. And the last example that I want to show is the real big data health analytics. It uses the UK biobank data. So we have uh, the actual data set includes half a million individuals. We've only extracted about 10,000 10, individuals that had both imaging, genetics, clinical, and physiological assessments. So we wanted to have individuals that have imaging because we know how to really process these things really well. And what we were trying to predict in this case is we wanted to uh, identify people with and without depression. So that's the binary clinical diagnosis that we are trying to classify using uh, decision trees, for instance. Now, this is the decision tree. I know you can't read it. It's not important to read it. What it is important to see is that this decision tree after pruning becomes much simpler. During the pruning process, of course, your accuracy is going to be reduced, but not by much. You go from 0.85 or, or so to 0.8. Okay? If you use the correct uh, kind phase estimates, if you go ahead and use the epoch averaged chyme phases. In the same situation, the very same binary variable is being predicted. Obviously, things are going to be compromised. So the decision tree in this case has an accuracy of 0.8. Very, very different tree in this case. The prune tree is also different. The, the classification accuracy decreases substantially. And kappa goes down from 0.6, look at this, to 0.1. So obviously, you're, you're losing information uh, when you don't reconstruct the signals correctly. And at the very uh, uh, last uh, instance where you actually use new phases, you're kind of saying, well, I've got absolutely no information, no prior knowledge that I can factor into this model. Then the decision tree has an accuracy of, well, about uh, 0.8 again, mind you. However, the accuracy goes down to about 0.57, which is essentially trivial for a binary classification if you prune the tree. That's evidence number one. And evidence number two for the very same uh, case study, we actually looked at uh, averaging the corresponding uh, coefficients across all the top 120 or so most critical features in this data set. Remember, we had close to 7,000 features for all individuals. Some were observed, some were derived. And if you look at the green, which is the, the real average of the coefficients across individuals, and the average they're much closer together, right? They kind of go together in, in very high synchrony, whereas the red one, where the phases are ignored, is all over the place. Obviously, inference on the red signal is going to generate much different results. So finally, to conclude, we went through three steps. The first one was we defined some challenges. The second one is we went over some mathematical uh, foundations and some principles. We used these to, uh, to derive some analytics. And um, we showed some examples at the end that show how uh, powerful these techniques could be to analyze really complex data sets.
my, my last slide is essentially recognizing my colleagues. Uh, so here is Milan Valev who, who did most of the math, uh, my group, there is funding and colleagues uh, who have contributed uh, to this work. So thank you very much. I'll be happy to answer questions if there are any. Yeah. Uh, no, no uh, right, you're referring to this? Yes, yes. Uh, we, we can look at any uh, model quality criteria. The reason why we looked at the AIC is that it is a commonly used criterion to compare models. But you, you can use any other uh, uh, assessment strategy. Yeah, I mean, if you look at other measurements, They have a uh, same performance, like uh, usually, like smaller the AIC, the better the model. So if other measurements also have the same performance, maybe that's very interesting to see. You know, uh, not here. That's just a single measure. You can use like even like a BIC or the other criteria to compare the models. Yeah. Yeah. Sh certainly. Yeah. I, I agree. This may be useful. Any other questions? All right, sounds good. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.